making a hello world application is very easy. However, following all the best practices and creating the same hello world could be challenging and sometimes could be a learning curve. In this video, we are going to see 15 different best practices which you can leverage for creating your Kubernetes cluster or even deploying your application so that you don't miss out key things when you deploy your applications in production. Let's take a look at all of these. Press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss any update from Tech Primers. The first one is the namespace. Without a namespace, you cannot deploy an application or a pod within Kubernetes. However, you should realize that when you have multiple teams or multiple projects, you need to make sure you choose your namespaces perfectly. Let's consider you working for two different projects, but both these projects are handled by the same team. In this case, you cannot use the same namespace for deploying your microservices or your pods. Instead, you can leverage different namespaces. That way you can segregate your microservices or your pods specific to these namespaces and you can easily identify and manage them corresponding to a namespace so that it has its own secure boundary. It also creates an encapsulated boundary within your namespace so that you don't share some of these resources or your microservices which you don't mean to share across namespaces or across projects. All the best practices which I'm going to walk through are from the kubernetes.io website or sometimes I use an external website. I will leave the link for all these in the description below so you can take a look at all these links from there. The next best practice is with respect to service accounts. Service accounts are a way using which you can have or access control within a particular namespace. Earlier we just saw how we can leverage different namespaces. However, service accounts are the real deal which takes care of controlling who has access to what resource etc. For example, when you create a namespace, by default you get a default service account. When you do kubectl get service accounts, you will be able to see what are the different service accounts within that particular namespace. So see here there is a default namespace which is corresponding to age 1. We can create multiple service accounts and give corresponding authorization for those particular service accounts. For example here they have created a build robot and you can create you can create specific authorization. For example the build robot has access only to the secrets which is nothing but build robot token whatever. So the build robot service account cannot access other resources. If you're using AWS, service accounts are similar to the IAM roles using which you can control things within a namespace. So make sure you have a service account when you want to restrict some of these resources within a namespace. A classic example could be some other team trying to retrieve some of your resources, then how do you proceed with it? You can create a service account which could be doing only read-only uh, stuff. So that way you can use that for higher environments like test and prod where you don't have to do manual stuff using service accounts and your administrator wants to restrict you from providing full permissions to a particular role or a user. The third best practice is by leveraging an automated way for deploying your pods. You can either use customize which is provided by Kubernetes by default or you can leverage Helm or Terraform. Of course there are other tools using which you can automate as well but choose one particular tool and then use it for automating and integrating that within your CI CD pipeline. This will help creating a best practice when you're deploying your artifacts in dev, test and prod. The next one is by leveraging requests and limits within the pod. These are different resources using which you can control how much your pod can scale up and scale down. This will help you in controlling the memory leaks Sometimes applications tend to expand the memory if you don't have an explicit limit. You can control all these using the limits and the requests. For example, if you see here, there are different properties for the containers using resources where you can limit the CPU utilization, the memory utilization, etc. Now, how do you define that within the YAML? This is how you can define within the YAML. So, when you're deploying a pod within a container, you can define the resources section and you can have requests and you can have the memory defined along with the CPU. So the request signifies that you will at least need minimum this much memory and it cannot exceed the limits memory. So you can start off with 64 but you cannot exceed more than 128. 
So this is where requests and limits come into play. If within the cluster, if there is a node where there is no memory for 64M for provisioning this particular application, it won't be scheduled there. The next one is by leveraging the liveness probes and the readiness probes. Liveness and readiness helps us in identifying if the application has come up or not. And in addition to that, it checks if the application is alive or not. There could be a reason where the applications can go down or crash and Kubernetes needs to identify that the application is up or not. So it leverages something called as readiness and liveness probes using which it identifies if the application is alive or if the application is ready to serve traffic. So that way you have minimal downtime in terms of sending traffic to the application. So in order to define the liveness and readiness probes, you can again go to the container section and you can define specific liveness probes and the readiness probes. I do have a separate video on the liveness and readiness probes. If you are not sure what are these, take a look at them. The next one is the pod lifecycle. Pod lifecycle helps us in identifying what is the current state of the pod, whether the pod is running or it is in the fail state or is it starting up, what's happening within the pod. So using the pod lifecycle, you can catch those states within the application and you can trigger some specific actions. For example, let's say the pod is getting killed for some reason or maybe you're deploying a new application. Now during the killing process, you may have to handle the shutdown because you have, let's say, some threads which are connecting to different IO resources, like connecting to different APIs or connecting to different databases. And you want to smoothly shut down these connections. So in order to achieve that, you can catch these pod lifecycle events and handle that within the application. For example, like I said, you can have a shutdown hook integrated with the pod lifecycle when the pod crashes and your application can go and free up resources because your application is going down. Of course, there are a lot of things which you can do with pod lifecycle because it has different states. You have different conditions using which you can control how your readiness can be achieved. Do take a look at this example. I'm not going in depth, but you should leverage pod lifecycle whenever you need to handle some specific events which are coming from the pods. The next one is leveraging config maps for storing configuration information about the pods. Most of the time we store these in the properties file and we package that along with the application. However, these property files changes with respect to environment or with respect to clusters. Using config maps help us in creating a cluster specific configuration so that your application doesn't have to be changed or modified whenever there is a change within the cluster configuration. So you can leverage config maps to create configurations and use the application to read the config maps and then your application can behave based on those properties. For example, this is how you can create a config map. You can have a YAML where you can dump the config maps. For example, here we have game.properties and there is key value pairs which are defined. Now, how do you create config maps? Generally, you can follow the GitOps process so that you can have configurations stored in a separate repository and use the separate CI CD to deploy your configuration so that if you need to change something within your cluster, you can go and spin up a new deployment. You can spin up a new cluster deploy your config maps and you can deploy your application directly so that your application by can behave irrespective of whichever cluster you are running it from. If you're not sure about what is GitOps, do take a look at my video on what is GitOps and how you can leverage GitOps to automate your infrastructure provisioning. The next big item in the best practice is logging. Most of the time pods don't log properly and then we miss out on what got logged and what happened within the application. Following a proper architecture in terms of logging and getting those logs out of the pods are a critical step when you go into higher environments. So make sure your logging architecture is sorted. So this is what happens, right? When an application is pushing logs, it pushes to a log file. We need to somehow get the logs from the log file shipped to our logging system. Most of the time we all use systems like Logstash or Splunk, etc where we centrally store all our logs. In order to get all these logs from the pods, you can have a sidecar which can be deployed along with the application, which can read the log file and then push those messages into a topic. It could be a Kafka topic or it could be any queue. Since these are log messages, it makes sense to use Kafka here. So you can have a sidecar which is reading all the messages from your log file and then it is pushing that into a Kafka topic and your Splunk or your Logstash could be consuming all these messages from there and then you can see all the logs from a central logging system. This is one common practice which a lot of companies use 
and there are different tools like Fluent D, Fluent Bit, which can push all these messages into a topic which can be consumed by different log management platforms. I do have a video on Kubernetes observability using Linkerd. Do take a look at that particular video because it will have information about logging, monitoring, etc. Those are key when you have to promote your application to higher environments like production. The next one obviously is the monitoring bit. Without monitoring, you cannot make sure your application is stable. You will have to set up monitoring and you will have to have alerts configured for your application so that you will have observability track for your application. There are different tools like Neuralic, Datadog, Grafana, Prometheus, etc. You can leverage all these to create a monitoring system and using which you can monitor your application. If you're using service mesh like Linkerd or maybe Istio, you do get by default Prometheus and Grafana. You can use those to directly monitor your application. If you're not using any of these, you will have to have a sidecar deployed and then you will have to use these sidecars to push all these metrics into a central Prometheus or Grafana instance. So here, the link which I'm showing you is an example of Grafana on how you can set up Grafana with your Kubernetes cluster, how you can push these metrics into Prometheus and you can use Grafana to visually see what's happening within your cluster. Again, the microservices observability example, which I had shown earlier, will cover the monitoring part as well. The next one is making sure your clusters are running in multiple regions or multiple zones even. If you have a single cluster, for example, if you're running it in Amazon, you can have multiple availability zones within the same cluster and you cannot span a cluster across regions. So in that case, you will have to spin up a new cluster. So you will have to have regional clusters and make sure you deploy or you have a standby instance ready so that you can flip from one region to another when there is a disaster. Now you can ask me, though my application is small, do I still need to deploy them in multiple clusters? You don't have to deploy them or you don't have to have it active active. However, make sure that you can spin up your instance in the passive zone whenever something happens to your active zone. Because most of the time we just concentrate on one particular region and then make sure we deploy our application in one particular region. But then have a backup ready so that you will be able to spin up your instance maybe within few minutes or few hours so that you don't have any downtime for your clients. The next best practice is to use a smaller container image. Most of the time if you use a bloated container image, it takes a lot of time for the application to spin up or the pod to come up because downloading the whole container image from a container repository takes a while and your application needs to be brought up so there could be a lot of different tasks which could be performed by your base container image which you don't require. In that case, your application could be taking a while to scale up when you need to quickly scale up. So that's where you should have an image which is smaller in size and keep a check on what things you're packaging within that particular image. Don't package unnecessary stuff unless or until it is mandatorily required. So keep your images small so that way you can scale your instances much faster. So the next one is using the pod security policy using which you restrict the access of the pods. Make sure you don't run the pods as root so that way you don't expose any vulnerability from the pod to creep into the cluster. If you don't provide enough specific cluster roles for any specific pods then you might end up exposing your pod to the cluster level vulnerability. For example, you can run or provide role for the pod to have only a specific access to some of these folders and structures and etc. and make sure you run them only using that particular role. For example, here we can create a pod security policy using which you can restrict that this pod should not be allowed to run as privileged. So when you run it as privileged, then it will have root access. If it doesn't run as privilege, you can provide run a specific access to that particular pod. And that is what is mentioned here. So this helps us in reducing the vulnerability. If a particular pod is compromised, you won't be able to run root level commands from the pod, which can expose into a multi-level vulnerability issue within the cluster. The next one is the network policies. Using the network policy, you can control the incoming and the outgoing connection, obviously using the ingress route you can control the ingress connection and using the network policy you can control who can access which particular application for example you want to restrict access to a particular namespace you can do that within the network policy 
for example you want to block ip addresses you can do that within the network policy so using network policies you can create a boundary from within the pod which can go and block your connections now how do you do it you can use the ingress and the egress sections and you can control who can access what for example you can control the namespace selection and you can block the ip address and you can say i want to allow only from this particular namespace and only from this particular ip address range and you can also have a exception block which you want to block that particular cider the same goes for accessing external ip addresses so from the application if you want to connect to different ip addresses outside you can also control that if you don't know the ip addresses you can even have a pod selector or the namespace selector using which you can control access to this particular application so this is one another key policy which you can leverage within kubernetes for securing your pods the next one is using secrets however don't use secrets directly for storing credentials leverage vaults so that you can store secrets in vaults and use secrets for storing some sensitive information which gets expired often because things which you store in secrets are just encoded using base64 format and if your cluster gets compromised you can still go and look at your password directly so secrets are not secured in the sense that it still can be exposed so make sure you use a vault and don't completely rely on secrets for storing everything you can still store some sensitive information but make sure those information are going to be expiring once in a while also there are some rbac rules in terms of creating who can access the secrets and also enabling encryption at rest which you can see here which you should enable by default within your cluster now how do you define secrets within your application you can definitely leverage um, the secrets resource so you can create a secret and you can inject data you can inject the yaml file you can inject property file etc and you can use that within your application in the pod by mounting that into a volume mount and then use that within the application like how you read a file something like this so if you don't know how to do secrets i do have a video on secrets as well the next one is using volumes of course a lot of us want to use volumes but make sure these volumes are not coming from within the same cluster because if let's say your volumes are mounted to a node which is within the cluster and if let's say you are creating a new cluster there are chances that you will lose data from those volumes if you want to reload them or restore them from your existing backup in that case you can definitely offload your data to an external volume so leverage volumes with an external configuration or an external mount using which you can read write and then you can store data into those volumes so even if the cluster goes down you can mount that to a new cluster and then restore the data right so either you have to take a backup and then restore it or have an external volume mount and do have backups on those volume mounts so when you're using volumes don't directly use the ephemeral volumes which are present on the disk use some external volumes when you want to use it in a production application of course you know how to use volumes by using volume mounts similar to how you will be using in secrets but the only thing is here you will have to create a specific volume from the disk when you're using an external volume mount you can mount that and then use that particular resource within the pod those are the 15 different best practices which i think are important than the others of course there are a lot of other best practices which you can leverage for promoting your application to production do mention the ones which i had missed and whichever you think makes sense than these whichever we saw in this particular video as always if you like the video go ahead and like it if you haven't subscribed to the channel go ahead and subscribe to it meet you again in the next video thank you very much